Focus on Headline. Now let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our reporters in Yoon Hae-jung and Chang Hana. Guys, welcome back. Good, Good evening. evening. Hannah, what were you screaming at me the other before? <laughs> is it an SF9? No. Where Lone is... No, it's called Super Show 9 by oh. Super Junior. I've never heard of it. <laughs> you never heard of Super Junior? No, Super Junior Show. Oh, I've never heard of Super Show 9, but I've heard of Super Junior. Oh, so you went to a Super Junior concert. That's... Uh, mm-hmm. It's nice. That's super. Uh, anyways, uh, concerts, concerts, concerts. We're not going to be talking about concerts. We're going to be talking about that in the second hour. But uh, we got some uh, economic data to take a look at here due to the strong export performance of semiconductors and, of course, a number of other factors. South Korea's current account surplus has expanded to its largest in six years and nine months. However, as I've always emphasize when it comes to trade surpluses there are other aspects of things that we need to look into to see whether or not this is all positive uh, things to look at here but nevertheless uh, Hannah let's get more figures on this sure now according to the preliminary statistics released by the Bank of Korea on Wednesday the current account surplus for June was recorded at 12.26 billion dollars which is approximately 16.89 trillion one now this was the third largest surplus ever recorded following June 2016 and September 2017, and the largest in six years and nine months. Now, the BOK stated that the current account for June showed significant improvement, primarily driven by the goods balance. And as a result, the accumulative current account surplus for the first half of the year was $37.73 billion, a substantial improvement compared to the same period last year. Now, this figure greatly exceeds previous current account forecasts. The BOK projected that the current account surplus trend would continue into the second half of the year, and the sustained strong export performance due to the improvement in global manufacturing conditions and favorable investment income are expected to maintain the surplus trend for the time being. However, it also added that there are high uncertainties due to potential U.S. economic conditions, possible slowdown in AI investments, monetary policy directions of major countries, and the U.S. U.S. presidential election, along with the geopolitical risks such as conflicts in the Middle East. It was also mentioned that despite uncertainties in the revenue models of U.S. big tech companies, their investment trends are expected to continue and there is no significant change in the outlook for continued strong semiconductor exports. Now, in terms of the current account for June, the good balance reported uh, recorded a surplus of $11.47 billion, marking a 15-month streak of surpluses since April of last year. The surplus was the largest since September 2020. Exports amounted to $58.82 billion, an increase of 8.7% compared to June of last year. And after rebounding in October 2023, exports have continued to grow for nine consecutive months. In contrast, imports totaled $47.35 billion, which is a decrease of 5.7% from a year earlier. So when we look at a decrease in imports, uh, is it a good news? Is it bad news? Well, there's a lot of red flags into this, right? Again, we always like to say that a trade surplus is obviously a positive thing for the country. We're selling more than we're buying. uh, So we want to see that number grow higher and higher. However, We also want to keep the import numbers a certain figure because it gives us a sort of a uh, economic, uh, uh, I guess, uh, indication that there is demand because going into a report by the Korea Development Institute that was released on Wednesday, the South Korean economy it is on track to recover on the back of strong exports, as we talked about here. Obviously, if you have a huge trade surplus, that means it's on the back of the strong exports. But sluggish domestic demand has limited the overall economic improvement. This is the other thing that we need to look at when we see lower import figures here. Hejong, tell us uh, how the Korean economy is doing right now. 
Right. Korea Development Institute, or KDI, a state-run think tank, released its monthly economic assessment report. KDI said the Korean economy has sustained strong export growth, primarily fueled by the semiconductor sector. However, domestic demand remains subdued, constraining overall economic improvement, and the KDI has pointed to weak domestic demand since late last year. In July, exports advanced 13.9 percent on year to 57.4 billion U.S. dollars, the 10th straight monthly gain as semiconductor sales jumped 50.4 percent to 11.2 billion U.S. dollars. Strong exports led to the output in the chip sector jumping 8.1 percent on month in June, but the overall industrial produ- production fell for the second consecutive month. Uh, meanwhile, consumption of goods have, have been sluggish in on-year terms. June's retail sales fell 3.6% as a result of high inflation and high interest rates. Autos, apparels, and food and beverages were some of the products that posted an on-year decline in sales. Service consumption also slowed down, led by accommodation and restaurant services. And construction investment continued its sluggish trend as well, especially with a bigger decline in the building sector. KDI's report said that services production growth remained tepid and construction investment continued its fall, indicating that the recovery phase of domestic demand has not yet materialized. Regarding inflation, it said that while consumer price inflation increased slightly due to higher petroleum prices, uh, the underlying inflation rate continues to be in line with the inflation target of 2%. The institution also said external uncertainties have slightly slightly increased on the recent escalation of geopolitical risks in the Middle East and concerns over a U.S. economic recession. Yeah, but that's the thing, though, right? They keep talking about uh, the core inflation. You you take out uh, the volatile energy prices and the food prices, then in that case, it's gone track to that 2% range that they're talking about here. But what affects us the most out of everything? It's the food prices, it's the energy prices, especially given the fact that during the high heat, intense heat that we're experiencing with all the electricity that we're using right now. And a lot of that coming off, of course, energy. We talk about the fuel prices. Uh, A lot of people are traveling nowadays, fuel prices going up. It's not going to, it's not as good as we're, we're looking at right now, which is why one of the things that we looked at is, and this has been a very contentious issue with the rival parties when it comes to the the distribution, the cash handout of like Mm -hmm. what, 250,000 Korean won to each person. The the idea that the DP has is that because there is no domestic consu- uh, consumer spending that's going on, uh, that there's no money being injected into the Korean economy, right? On the flip side, the PPP arguing that that's only going to in- lead to inflation, which they're correct. I mean, if you're gonna, that's what happened to the United States when Biden administration was just dishing out different COVID money here and there. You, you know, the Oprah thing. You get money, you get money, everybody gets money. <laughs> inflation happened, right? And so there's big concerns in regards to this. But still, though, the overall state of the Korean economy at this time right now not looking very, very good. And that you can see by the lack of consumption by the domestic, the consumers right now. And so that needs to improve. And so by looking at just the trade surplus in itself doesn't show the entire picture of how the Korean economy is going. And in fact, a number of uh, uh, economists and uh, economy experts that we've talked to in the past few weeks now have all indicated that there are some red flags right now with the Korean economy, but it's not being mentioned as much, right? We just talk about the, the, the positive figures here, which is concerning. Let's talk about a report by Reuters uh, on Wednesday. Samsung Electronics has passed a qualification test for the fifth generation high bandwidth memory or HBM, as we know by uh, HBM E, uh, sorry, 3E. This is the high A. Uh, I believe the way that it's uh, uh, named is by how much you can stack up Mm -hmm. with these uh, high uh, high bandwidth memory. This for the supply to NVIDIA. Uh, We've talked about this before. However, Samsung Electronics responding that it's conducting tests with major customers effectively denying the reports here. Hannah, let's get more on this. 
Sure. Now, Reuters cited three anonymous sources suggesting that Samsung Electronics and NVIDIA are expected to sign a supply contract soon, with supplies anticipated to begin in the fourth quarter. However, sources indicated that testing for HBM3E is still ongoing. NVIDIA has not responded to Reuters' request for comment, and Samsung Electronics stated that we cannot confirm details related to customer companies, but then added that they are currently conducting tests with major customers. Now, in the industry, it is believed that Samsung's uh, HBM3 E8 High is still undergoing NVIDIA's quality test, and Reuters had previously reported in May, based on sources, that Samsung's HBM products are uh, or have not passed the quality test yet due to issues with heat and power consumption. However, Samsung Electronics rebutted, saying that we are smoothly progressing with tests for HBM supply with various global partners. On the 31st of last month, during the second quarter earnings conference call, Samsung al- announced that it plans to mass produce and begin supplying the HBM 3E8 high product within the third quarter of this year, with the 12 high product to be supplied in the latter half of the year. Typically, the supply volume of HBM is determined based on contracts made with customers, so there is speculation that the quality test pass for HBM 3E is imminent, and supply to major GPU manufacturers like NVIDIA and AMD will proceed smoothly. Samsung has also completed ramp-up preparations for the HBM 3E 12 High product, which it developed as the industry's first and plans to expand supply in the latter half of the year according to multiple customers. Customer request. Currently, SK Hynix, which leads the HBM market, has essentially monopolized the supply of HBM 3E to uh, NVIDIA and started mass production and supply of HBM 3E8 high in March. And for Samsung to ride the AI semiconductor wave and continue improving its performance, supplying HBM to NVIDIA is crucial. Now, considering factors like price negotiation power and supply, NVIDIA also needs Samsung's HBM supply. And according to market research from TrendForce, HBM 3E is expected to become mainstream in the HBM market as deliveries concentrate in the latter half of this year. Samsung has forecasted that HBM 3E chips will account for 60% of HBM sales by the fourth quarter, and the market believes that achieving this goal is possible if Samsung's latest HBM chips receive final approval by the third quarter. Yeah, so this is the big one because if you look at uh, how SK Hynix has really bounced back uh, over the past like year and a half or so it's because of the HBM production and uh, NVIDIA obviously being the the big big powerhouse when it comes to AI uh, chips they need all the HBM the HBM system is kind of interesting like I'm not I'm not a like I'm terrible with computer stuff right all (laughs) I know how to do is turn on the computer and turn off the computer and uh, use the internet but because it requires so much memory before it used to be that you would kind of like uh, set it vertically right which then takes up too much space and Mm -hmm. so the hbm uh, sorry not horizontally check that and then so the hbm you're stacking it horizontally i believe taking up less space and being able to use more memory and that's what hbm is and considering the fact that right now i believe the united states is trying to uh prevent companies like micron sk hynix and the sk what is it uh, samsung electronics from selling these hbm to chinese uh, companies now A lot of this going into NVIDIA being that they basically have the the biggest market share of AI technology, it is going to be very crucial for Samsung Electronics to have a deal in place with them. So we'll keep a close tab. We did see that Jensen Huang, who is the CEO of uh, NVIDIA, mentioned the HPM technology of Samsung in the past. So that's that. Uh, Let's move on here. We talked about uh, the recruitment process for the second half of the year for uh, trainee doctors that haven't gone so well. Uh, government is now going to allow hospitals to extend the application period for the trainee doctor program starting this Friday uh, in order to help hospitals recruit more doctors. Uh, to ease the burden on emergency departments, the government will gradually increase the co-payment for non-emergency payments visiting emergency rooms. Uh, Hedgen, let's get the latest updates on this. According to the Ministry of Health, as of this Monday, a total of 1,091 resident doctors returned to their training sites. 
Uh, of the 5,701 resident doctors who resigned, 625, or about 11% of them, have returned to General Hospital so far. Now, that's more than double the 258 who returned last week. And it turns out only 91 applicants have applied for the resident doctor programs for the second half of this year. As major hospitals have received few or no applications at all for trainee doctor programs, which start in September, the government will allow hospitals to extend the application period for the program starting this Friday. Now, first year residents will be recruited until next Wednesday and second to fourth year residents and interns recruited until next Friday. Then the government plans to hold a written examination for first year residents next Saturday and then complete the selection process for each hospital by the end of this month so that the second half of the year of the training program can begin in September. In the meantime, as the mass resignations posed a heavy burden, especially on the emergency departments, the government plans to gradually increase the share of payment made by non-emergency patients who visit the emergency room. Patients with mild symptoms who visit regional emergency medical centers will be transferred to local emergency centers so that regional emergency centers can focus on treating severe cases. The government will also encourage additional recruitment of emergency department doctors and deploy public health and military doctors to regional and local emergency centers uh, where they are facing a shortage of specialists. Now, despite the uh, ongoing six months or so, the medical medical vacuum that we've been seeing because of the mass resignation by the trainee doctors, uh, the government emphasizes its plan to transform the structure of tertiary and general hospitals in the country to focus more on specialists. Uh, Hannah, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, the government plans to make tertiary hospitals as key institutions for regional medical cooperation and introduced a specialist referral and return system, which ensures that patients referred by cooperating hospitals will receive the earliest possible care. Now, to reduce reliance on resident doctors at tertiary hospitals, the government is also considering setting standards for the number of patients per resident. They plan to reform the residency training system by actively utilizing physician assistants, also known as PAs, to decrease the dependence on residents in tertiary and general hospitals. The government also mentioned plans to review the cost structure to ensure that patients use medical services appropriate to the medical delivery system. They suggested that increasing costs for inappropriate medical use by less critical ill patients might be possible, but discussions with patient and consumer groups are necessary. Furthermore, the government promised to implement specific compensation structure reforms for the transition of tertiary hospitals without delay, including strengthening compensation for severe admissions and surgeries and adequately compensating for efforts such as waiting times in emergency care. Regarding the issue of the licensing system for private practice, the government noted that the proportion of medical residents is gradually decreasing after graduating from medical school, raising concerns that doctors without clinical experience might start practicing. And starting next month, the government plans to launch a pilot project for a structural reform, supporting hospitals that are already among the 47 tertiary hospitals. And the Korean Medical Association, KMA, criticized the government's policy direction, stating that the Special Committee on Medical Reform operated primarily by civic groups without the participation of experts like the KMA is proceeding haphazardly and possess, uh, poses a significant threat threat to public health and safety. They condemned the government's policies as nonsense. The KMA argued that the plan to operate hospitals with specialist and supportive nurses neglects the fundamental role of university hospitals in educating and training excellent specialists. They claim that presenting nurses as skilled professionals to deceive the public is mis misleading. They further demanded that the government should listen to the voices of medical experts to quickly address the current medical crisis rather than merely expanding the scope of nurses duties without presenting fundamental solutions well nurses are skilled professionals uh, i mean they certainly don't have the same kind of skills as doctors do but from what i understand uh during the six months or so of the medical vacuum that we've been seeing because of the lack of trainee doctors uh a lot of the burden has been on the nurses right now uh which i believe now 
uh, all the more calls for the, the nurse, Nursing Act, right, that, that was uh, vetoed by President Yoon before. Now even the PPP uh, is calling for maybe a, a slight revision to the previous uh, Nursing Act and uh, maybe passing this act right now because could the current situation with the hospitals right now. But uh, nevertheless, uh, six months, almost six months, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, there's no signs of this, uh, you know, uh, any kind of resolutions or solutions to this. And it really is unfortunate here. Uh, let's talk about, speaking of acts and bills, uh, ruling and main opposition parties uh, agreed on Wednesday to swiftly deal with bills on livelihood issues that were left aside amid the months-long partisan dispute over some contentious bills that we've been talking about. And this is exactly what we talked about, right? I mean, uh, it's one thing that the, the ruling PPP have not been really enjoying. Uh, well, actually, they've been seeing an increase in their approval rating. It's more the main opposition Democratic Party uh, that's been losing their approval rating because of the fact that they continue to put up these contentious bills that are going to get vetoed and not get passed anyways instead of passing these crucial livelihood bills. Seems like the two sides come to an agreement finally. Hajung, give us the details of this. Right. Kim Sang-un, the top policymaker of the ruling People Power Party, and Jin Sung-jun, the main opposition Democratic Party's chief policymaker, reached an agreement during their first policy meeting at the National Assembly. Kim say, said they reviewed approximately 50 bills proposed by the DP and found several that the PPP can accept, pointing out livelihood bills that aim to protect victims of crimes, among others. Jin also agreed that there are quite a few bills that the rival parties can agree on. While parties are set to first handle bills with little difference between the two sides, such as revisions to the nursing laws, summertime electricity fee reductions for vulnerable groups, acts to prevent Jeonse fraud and the Korean Chips Act, they still remain at odds over income taxation on financial investments, which is set to take effect in January next year. The PPP side has stressed the need for the DP to accept the abolition of the financial investment tax, while the DP maintained its position that the tax should be implemented as scheduled. Uh, Legislated in December 2020, the scheme involves levying at least 20% tax on annual financial investment gains exceeding 50 million won, which is roughly 36,300 US dollars beginning next year. Uh, The presidential office has also urged urged the National Assembly on Wednesday to positively review the government's proposal to scrap the soon-to-be-implemented financial investment income tax. The office said the financial income investment income tax could disadvantage retail investors at a time when the local stock market is greatly affected by rising volatility in the global financial market. It added that 14 million individual investors, most of them being middle class, will suffer the damage. The government and the ruling PPP have opposed the financial investment income tax on concerns over its negative impact on the local stock market. While the main opposition DP is divided on the issue even within the party, like former DP le- leader Lee Jae-myung being against it, while chief policymaker Jin Sung-jun is saying the bill should be pushed through. Yeah, so the argument here, number one, uh, the DP has been arguing that, number one, there's already a, a, a tax revenue shortfall, right? We've been talking about this for over a year now, actually. Uh, and they're also arguing that I don't know about you guys. I don't. I don't know if you guys do stocks, but for you to have a profit of fifty million one annually, you have to be so good. We talked about this <laughs> yesterday. Well, <laughs> so, so good, but also you have to have a lot of money to be able to <laughs> feed money. You know, yeah. invest a lot of that money to in order to get you know profit for this. So the DP was arguing that you're only pro- you know helping out the mm-hmm. rich, mm-hmm. right? I mean. Average people do not have money to invest so that they'll profit 50 million won a year, which is, I mean, that's that's 36,000 US dollars a year on just stock. That's a, that's a lot. I mean, some people can't say that they got that much amount in like, you know, the long term uh, investment. So that's what's going on right now. But is that really the livelihood stuff? There's other livelihood stuff, like the, the energy stuff, right? I think this is the reason why uh, the, the, re- the, public has been very, very frustrated with this. In fact, this is exactly what they were complaining mm-hmm. about uh, during the uh, leading up to the April general elections. However, the two sides continue to bicker. Same thing over and over again. Hopefully, they'll change things here. Uh, last month, oh boy, the national, the nationwide average minimum temperature 
was the second highest on record. Tropical nights occurred more frequently than ever before. They're not even talking about tropical nights anymore. They're talking about super tropical nights now. Mm. Hannah, tell us more about the weather conditions. Sure. Now, according to the climate analysis released by the Korea Meteorological Administration on Wednesday, the national average temperature for last month was 23.3 degrees Celsius, placing it among the top five highest July averages since national weather observations began in 1973. Compared to the average July temperatures from 1991 to 2020, last month's average temperature was 1.6 degrees higher. And overall, it was hotter at night than during the day last month. The highest average minimum temperature for July was recorded at 23.4 degrees Celsius in July 1994, one of the hottest years in history. And the difference between 1994 and last month's average minimum temperature was only 0.1 degrees Celsius. Now, the comparison of heat waves and tropical nights also show that nighttime heat was more severe. And notably, last month's tropical nights were the most frequent for July since records began in 1973. Until mid-July during the monsoon season, it was often cloudy and rainy, so daytime temperatures were not excessively high. However, humid and hot southwesterly winds persisted at night, causing nighttime temperatures to significantly exceed normal levels. The North Pacific High extended its influence further north and west than usual, bringing southwesterly winds into Korea along the edges of this high pressure system. Warm air from the tropical western Pacific, where sea surface temperatures were higher than average, descended in the subtropical region near Taiwan, contributing to the expanded North Pacific High. Since July 25th, the North Pacific High covered the Korean Peninsula entirely, leading to persistent heat waves during the day. And particularly from July 27th to 31st, the North Pacific High extended up to the Tibetan High, resulting in the overlap of two high-pressure systems over the Korean Peninsula. Now, this overlap caused an adiabatic batic warming, which is a phenomenon where the temperature rises as air is compressed in a high-pressure system, exacerbating the heat. Now, the extreme heat last month was also influenced by climate change, and the intense heat is expected to continue at least until after August 15th, Korea's National Liberation Day. Yeah, we need to be liberated from the heat right now. <laughs> See, the thing about tropical nights is, right, you can say that, well, the, the heat that you're seeing, a lot of people are saying, well, you could turn on the air conditioner and things like that. And yes, it's true. Like, I, you know, I turn on the air conditioner. Uh, I got the fan going on at night, so it's not hot. But because of the humid conditions outside and the hot temperatures, like it's doing something to our bodies. And I've had a number of nights where I just couldn't sleep whatsoever. And mm-hmm. I had like, what, like an hour and a half of sleep and going to work and stuff like that. And it's impact. And it's a lot. Of, it's angering a lot of people, too. People are getting <laughs> angry. It's been no a lot of yeah, people say that they are angry 97% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like they're always angry. 97 seems like an understatement, to yeah. be honest with you, what's going on right now. Uh, let's go on into some uh, international news here. Hamas is saying that it's chosen its uh, top military commander in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar. This is a name that we've heard of in a number of of occasions he is now the new political leader uh for hamas he's replacing former political leader ishma haneye who was killed last week in iran now sinwar is believed to be the mastermind uh, behind the october 7 terror attacks which led to basically kicked off all the conflict that we're seeing right now in the middle east although conflicts in the middle east is nothing new it's been always going on for for many many years Uh, But this is also sparking fears that this might cause even further escalation in the Middle East. Hejong, let's get the latest on this. Hamas has named Yahya Sinwar as its new chief, replacing Ismail Haniyeh, who was assassinated in Tehran last week. Since 2017, Sinwar has served as the group's leader inside the Gaza Strip. Now, prior to his death, Ismail Haniyeh was viewed by regional diplomats as a pragmatic figure compared to others in Hamas, a key driver of the group's political outreach. But Yahya Sinwar, on the other hand, is viewed as one of Hamas's most extreme figures. 
A uh, 61-year-old Noir is seen by Israel as the mastermind behind the planning and execution of the October 7th attack. And Noir has not been seen in public since the devastating attacks, defying Israel's attempts to kill him since the start of the conflict. Iran has reportedly vowed to carry out a revenge attack against Israel over Hanye's killing in Tehran, and Hezbollah has also threatened to retaliate in response to the ki- killing of its military commander by Israel last week. Uh, without specifying the form or timing of the attack. And amid growing fears that the situation could escalate into an all-out regional war, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has said ceasefire negotiations have reached a final stage and that Washington is working with Egypt and Qatar to finalize an agreement as soon as possible. And the U.S. includes a war on its blacklist of international terrorists. I don't know how many times I heard final stages of negotiations uh, between all the sides involved here. Uh, The problem with this is there's too many mediating sides here. And uh, it's really between Israel and Hamas. And Israel is not going to back down. Hamas is not going to back down. They got nothing to lose. Israel knows that the longer this goes on, that uh, they're probably, it's going to benefit them. It's just that it's internationally there's not a lot of fans of israel right now and especially i believe i think was it the finance minister that came at israel's finance minister said something really really controversial over um a couple of days ago that's uh, further uh you know lacking lagging the uh, the, the support for israel after his uh, comments but uh the concerns right now again is what kind of retaliatory measures that they're going to see from uh maybe iran hamas hezbollah uh, all these uh, proxy forces from what we understand, there is a major Jewish holiday next week on the 13th, August 13th. And some are saying that maybe that might be the day uh, that they might uh, spark some kind of retaliatory attack, which is going to, I mean, ultimately to all death of the civilians, right? That's the big thing, right? Uh, let's move on here. The news that uh, at least all the Democrats were uh, waiting for, uh, Kamala Harris, the, the uh, presumed the uh, Democratic Party candidate for the U.S. presidential election has finally selected her running mate. It's not Shapiro. It is not Mark Kelly. Mark Kelly was the favorite going into this. It is Tim Waltz, uh, relatively unknown uh, before all of this. He's a progressive governor of Minnesota. Uh, he is a former teacher. He is a war uh, a, 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 a war veteran. Hannah, let's get the latest on Harris's running mate. Sure. Now, the U.S. presidential election in November will feature a contest between the Democratic ticket of Harris and Waltz and the Republican ticket of Donald Trump and J.D. Vance. Now, Governor Waltz, who has been serving as the governor of Minnesota since 2019, after six terms as a federal congressman, has a strong record of advocating for workers and championing progressive policies. He is known for his clear and rational explanation of key democratic issues such as gun control and public education. Waltz particularly drew attention in the election campaign by describing the Republican vice presidential candidates, former President Trump and Senator Vance, as they are weird, a term that was well received by the Democratic base. Now, born in a small town in Nebraska, Waltz began his career as a high school geography teacher and football coach before entering politics. He also followed in his father's footsteps, who was a Korean War veteran by serving in the National Guard for 24 years, building a reputation as a modest and approachable politician with a voter-friendly background. He first engaged in politics as a volunteer for Democratic presidential candidate John Kerry in 2004, and during his time as a federal congressman, he had, or he was considered a moderate within the party due to his voting record on issues such as gun rights, Israel, and pipeline construction. However, as governor Governor, he has shown clear progressive tendencies on issues such as abortion, paid leave, universal free school meals, and background checks for gun buyers. His modest and relatable background, including his move from Nebraska to Minnesota in his early 30s and his education at a local state university, is seen as a potential asset in targeting the Democratic Party's weak areas, particularly swing states like Wisconsin and Michigan.
Michigan. Democrats believe that Walt could effectively counter the Republican strategy of appealing to middle-class voters in the Rust Belt by presenting him as an efficient countermeasure. He has also shown support for Israel's right to self-defense against Hamas while raising concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Harris and Waltz are set to begin their joint campaign with an appearance in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a key battleground state, and will continue their campaign in seven other swing states. Yeah, uh, just uh, when it comes to the governor of Minnesota, just Jesse Ventura, Jesse the Body Ventura was the name that I have have always kind of thought of. But uh, again, this is an interesting, interesting pick. And Mm -hmm. if I knew that calling Vans and Trump weird is going to be the thing that will get you to be the running mate. I mean, I've been calling them weird for like years now. I don't know why I was never a candidate for her running mate. Uh, British Prime Minister Keir Starmeyer said Monday that the standing army of specialists of police will be set up to deal with the, uh, to handle the anti-Muslim and the anti-immigrant riots that have rocked cities across the nation over the past week. It's really, really bad right now. Some of the stories that I've been hearing of what's going on across the UK, terrible stuff here. Hedrung, fill us in on this. Right. The Labour Party government led by Prime Minister Keir Starmer has been put to a major test just a month after taking office amid anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant violence across the UK. Protests first erupted the night after a stabbing rampage occurred in a seaside town of Southport last week at a dance class that killed three girls and wounded 10 people. And false rumors spread online that the suspect was a Muslim asylum seeker, which led to attacks on immigrants and mosques. For instance, on Sunday, uh, angry mobs attacked hotels uh, used to house asylum seekers, breaking windows and lighting lighting fires. Dozens of police officers have been hospitalized for the injuries. So far, more than 375 people have been arrested in the mayhem and more are expected. Many made court appearances on Monday and found themselves facing at least several weeks behind bars awaiting their next court hearing. And Prime Minister Starmer, also uh, a former chief of the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, took a hardline stance against the violent protests, uh, pointing the finger at far-right forces behind the chaos. He also announced that he would form a standing army of specialized police officers to ensure a timely response to any riots or violence. And even opposition parties, including the main opposition uh, Conservative Party, appear to show a united stance against the violence. Uh, But this is a very uh, tricky situation for the Starmer government uh, because the UK has a severe prison overcrowding problem with underfunded police. On top of that, the surge in immigrants entering the UK has exacerbated the religious and racial tensions. Yeah, it just kind of reminded me of uh, the United States uh, post 9-11. There was this uh, ongoing hatred towards Muslims because they blame the terrorist attack to all Muslims, and there was like burning, attacking people in mosques and things like that. Terrible stuff there. I hope, uh, I know we have a lot of uh, UK listeners on our program. I uh, hope everything is okay uh, where you guys are. Guys, uh, thank you very much for your reports today. Stay safe, uh, stay cool, and uh, we'll see you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.